Hello, this is Hector Del Castillo, and welcome everyone to today's webinar from AIPMM, the Association of International Product Marketing and Management. AIPMM is the world's largest organization for product management and product marketing and brand management. And it was founded in 1998. It actually is the world's largest certifying body for product management, product marketing, brand management, and innovation leadership. And today's speaker will be Cindy F. Solomon, who is also founder of Global Product Management Talk. And actually, before we uh, begin the presentation, and I will allow Cindy to introduce herself, I also want to acknowledge her for because she has been a very gracious host for us up until now. And uh, today, she actually, a speaker, will be talking about a very specific topic. She will continue to work with AIPMM and also uh, will continue to work on the global product management talk and all the activities, uh, including some of the meetups that she's organizing in San Francisco area. Also, what I wanted to point out is that we will have a drawing, so we encourage everyone, all of you, to participate in polls that we're going to be doing, as well as submit questions during the presentation. And I would strongly recommend that you use the questions chat window to submit your questions, uh, because during the Q&A period, we will be going over reading some of those questions, and then Cindy will be answering uh, all the questions, if as time allows. If there's more questions than, than we can accommodate, then Cindy will get back to you directly with uh, specifically uh, an answer to your question. And before we wrap up, but towards the end, you must be present to win. We will have a drawing for two different giveaways that we have today. Uh, one of the giveaways is a 12-month AIPMM Premium Membership. And the second giveaway is a Product Camp Silicon Valley T-shirt courtesy of Cindy F. Solomon. So without further ado, I'd like to get on with our presentation and welcome Cindy F. Solomon. Hi, thank you so much, Hector. It's very interesting to be on the other side. Uh, for the past year, I've been moderating this webinar series, and I'm uh, very grateful uh, to the AIPMM, an excellent organization who has certainly forwarded uh, the Global Product Management Talk uh, provided excellent mentorship for myself and uh, supports the meetups in the San Francisco Bay Area, the Startup Product Talk meetups. So I'm delighted to uh, be the speaker today to talk about how to create a culture for product excellence at your company. So I always start by asking the questions. Um, who, why, what, how? And so who? For me, I am uh, the founder of the Global Product Management Talk, which is a weekly broadcast on, on Mondays uh, where I talk to a thought leader about issues related to product excellence. Um, I started, it started as a Twitter chat a couple of years ago uh, because there's product managers all over the world and outside of the U.S., uh, they're very active on Twitter. And I thought it would be great to uh, have a weekly discussion, which occurred for uh, uh, a few months. And we realized that uh, we needed to record the speaker. So it has, I've continued to iterate on it, and it's become a very popular podcast. I made a Android uh, app, and it's available on iTunes. Um, I've also, uh, previous to becoming a product management evangelist, I've had a long career. Before I came out to the Valley, I uh, was an entrepreneur, and I also uh, computerized a marketing firm, uh, Thought I wanted to be a lawyer, worked in uh, trademark mark law, <laughs> uh, started a, a business before I was thirteen. Uh, before I was thirty, not before I was thirteen. Um, got investments, and it was before email. So I I don't like to date myself too much, but suffice it to say that I've had a computer in my home since, gosh, eighty seven. So, okay, so um. 
the global product management talk, it started with a tweet, which was picked up in Australia uh, by BrainMates. And we scheduled speakers who were on the Twitter chat weekly. Uh, we discovered quite quickly that not only were thought leaders not great tweeters, but uh, even though it was Twitter is excellent for having a parallel discussion amongst many too many people, it was very difficult to capture the complex issues we were discussing. So I started recording the leaders over Skype and then um, started recording directly live on Blog Talk Radio. So it's now Switch the Action Happens live uh, on the radio show. It's been two years where we've done 100 chats, is over 80 podcasts, and we generate uh, 20,000 listeners a week. So th that is an indication to me from the market that there is a lot of interest in these issues having to do with product management. And we really do, you know, expand it. We cover business management, but of course, my focus is on, on software applications and startups. So there's a lot of interest for it. And it really, from from doing the podcast and the Twitter chat, I was encouraged to start a meetup. And uh, we did a conference in February. There's over 1,100 members and new people come in. So shout out to the participants from the meetup. And uh, very exciting. Uh, we just posted October 12th, 2013. We will do a product camp San Francisco. So... You know, regarding how to create a culture, one of the basic tenets of creating a culture is, is talking about what's important and using social media, using all the venues that you have to talk about it, and also monitoring the market for who else is talking about it. So I maintain the global map of product camps worldwide. And Product Camp started right here in Silicon Valley by Rich Marinoff, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago. And the winner of the T-shirt will get the, uh, the most recent T-shirt from the sixth annual Silicon Product Camp, Silicon Valley. If you go to this map using that bit.ly, you can zero in on any of the P's. It will open up to the Product Camp in that area, and it will also have links to... Uh, tweets and content archives um, from those events. So the point here is that I wanted to capture what is product management about in different areas of the world? How are those communities different? What is similar? What What is unique? And um, it's very exciting. Here's the um, meetup, if you're not already a member. Uh, here is about the summit. We'll be having another one. And there's also a, uh, a website, startupproduct.com, where you can sign up for the newsletter. You can get the podcast. And I'm using all kinds of new tools to post in the blog, such as Scoop It and um, uh, another new tool I just saw today. Um, also, if you want to bring startup product meetups to your community, uh, there's a link to do that. So Startup Product is a movement for product excellence through cross-discipline collaboration and holistic product perspective. And this has really come about uh, from iterations, from talking with the community and hearing about what is constant uh, across different organizations and in and what makes a difference? What is the most effective thing? And of course, if you've been doing product management, you know that product managers have to work cross-functionally because we don't necessarily have direct reports. But what's been exciting for me is that there's been a lot of blogging occurring in Silicon Valley from people in the startup world um, talking about how cross-discipline collaboration is key to the team's uh, to generate excellent products, um, even though they're not naming it product management. So uh, you can go to meetup.com slash start a product, start a community in your area. Okay, so Hector, if you could do the first poll, which is, um, is there a poll asking who's in the room 
based on what their titles might be? There is not. There is the uh, one on the clear definition of a product manager and individual product manager mission statement. Okay, so let's let's hold off on the tool. When I give this presentation live, and also I suggest, I'll always ask who's in the room, who are you talking to, know who your audience is, and what their perspective is, and find out why they here? I want to make sure that in every interaction I'm providing value. And this is also key to how do you create a culture is make sure you're creating value and make sure you're speaking into the filtering of people's listening. So I'm always asking, what does it take to create a product-centric focus in your organization? Because that's really the under score for how, how do you arrive at product excellence? You need to create a product-centric focus. At least that's what I'm, I'm suggesting is key. And I'll go into it in more detail. And also, I hope to provide insights of how you raise the visibility, respect, and product leadership for increasing product success um, with your own toolkit. Okay, so I don't know who's in the room because I'm only seeing my slides right now, but let's let's establish some context. So always find out who you're talking to and then get everyone on the same page so they uh, can relate to what you're talking about. So when I talk with people about product management and I talk to people who want to get into product management a lot, I coach product management teams, individuals, and startups who don't yet have product management. So there's different ways when people hear product management of what they think it is. And the basic way is product management is a business foundation. Even if you don't have a designated product manager or a designated product management department of function in your organization, Product management is occurring, whether it's occurring on purpose, intentionally, if you have a product and if you're selling anything, by the way, a product is anything that generates revenue, although there can be internal products that are uh, anything that requires a process and uh, provides a result that adds value. Um, so product management is a noun. It is a profession. It is the foundation for what is occurring in any business. There is product management occurring, maybe not on purpose, but it is occurring. So Marty Kagan is a uh, thought leader in the Valley. For, for, for me, he represents product management from a technical point of view. And all those engineers who became product managers, his perspective is from the engineering point of view and that the purpose of product management is to drive out a technical build. Um, but it, product management, even he agrees, it's a key part of your company's overall product development organization and product development process. Um, however, he puts product management as a subset of the product development organization, and that's where we differ. For me, product management is the umbrella for everything else that is occurring around the product, and the product development is a subset of product management. So we'll, we'll delve further. Another way that people relate to product management is if there is a function within their business, is it's an organization function. It's a verb. Product management are, is, are, happens within the deliverables that the product managers are providing. And there are all these actions that need to occur in order to get the product from inception through development and out, out the door. And this is a traditional viewpoint that there's product-specific inbound responsibilities, um, starting with strategy, internal, uh, creating the requirements, understanding the users, uh, developing the process and the systems and the operations in order to get that product uh, built tested, qualified, and out the door. And so that that's a traditional view of, quote-unquote, product managers. 
And then in some big organizations, enterprise organizations, and with as big, many products and big teams, they might break out the outbound responsibilities and call it product marketing as a subset of the product management organization. And here they're focused on once that product is built, how built, how is it positioned? How is it described? What are the communications and marketing communications, um, the sales tools and everything that is required to get that product delivered, launched, delivered and marketed. And, uh, also, there's general business responsibilities that may fall under product management, um, that may uh, fall to a business analyst working within product management, or a project manager or program manager who's responsible for the profit and loss issues related to that product, guaranteeing that uh, there's a return on investment and monitoring uh, the financial data related to that product. So that's product management, the, the doing this. Then there's product management, the thing. If it does exist within a organization, it, it is called, again, product management, but it is higher up on the, <laughs> on the uh, uh, diamond here. And it may be focused in different ways depending on what type of company and product it is. So product management as a group or department may be strategic where they are actually looking out into the market for market opportunities and monitoring the competitive space and identifying new products and new versions or the product management department could just be scoped for doing execution, maintenance, and implementation of the product. It could be customer-driven, it could be sales-driven, or it could be what I see the most often, it's technology-driven, which means that product management isn't driving the product. The, the head of the company is an engineer or a uh, developer, and they're driving the product, and product management has to fulfill their vision. So when product management exists as a department or group, titles occur of product manager, product marketing manager, product owner, scrum master, agile project manager, program manager, um, and uh, UX person, I'm seeing a lot in small organizations, the user experience person is doing product management. And then there's the individual level, the product manager person, the professional, the individual practitioner. And so the reason why I broke these out is because as you're reviewing what product excellence means to you, you really should be looking at it from these different points of view, from the business. How did your business identify what product excellence is? And that would be uh, documented in the mission, the vision, the goals, and the intentions of the business otherwise known as key performance indicators. They may not be specifically quantifiable metrics, but as a product manager in an organization, if you don't have those metrics, number one, create those metrics. Uh, because you need to know if the product is aligned with the business mission and, and the business purpose. Because if, if it's not, that's a huge problem. Um, you want to make sure that everything you're doing as a product manager or to forward the product, not only is it aligned with the business mission, but it's aligned with the goals and the business case uh, originally set forth in the conception of that product. Um, wherever you, wherever that product is now, there is most likely have been many iterations since the original conception for the product. But as a product manager, you're charged with, with making sure the product is aligned because nobody else has a perspective. Everyone else is focused on doing their what they're charged with as best as they can, but only product management will have the overview across functions to make sure it's aligned. And I like to talk about 
uh, if anyone is familiar with sailing, um, in a sailboat, you have a goal that you want to get to, but you cannot get there in a straight way. Um, the sailing is very technical, and what you do is you tack. Um, you're, you're up against uh, changes in the wind. You're up against changes in the uh, water temperature, the waves, uh, other boats that might be coming by, not, as well as your, your team, the size of the boat. There's all these different uh, forces acting on you and preventing you from getting straight to where you want to go. So you have to be constantly responding, changing uh, where your sail is, how, how much you let go, how much you pull in, and tacking back and forth to get to where you want to go. And so as a product manager, you're, you're captain of this ship and you have to be making sure that the product stays aligned to the business goals. The product team stays aligned with the other uh, teams that you're interfacing with and that you and your career stays aligned with what your own identification is for what product excellence is for you. And this this happens a lot that people will uh, say, hey, they really need product management therapy. They're kind of burnt out or they're upset because um, what what their goals are for the product, uh, the company is not supporting. The team is not uh, aligned with and not, and not behind. And instead of them shepherding a product through all the processes, they're, they're spending every day fighting or putting out fires. And this is where um, I suggest it's, it's time for them to either get another job or to really take a step back and look at how can, how can they fix this how can they work throughout the organization to communicate what's going on? Um, because if you're in pain, guess what? It's, it's someone else in your organization is, and I'm sure the product is not doing well. So, okay. So I say, <laughs> for, for many years I arrived that for me, this is what my definition of product management is for me. The product managers create context for the product within the company, within the development process, with all the stakeholders and within the industry market channel and end user community. And for me, being a great product manager and product marketing leader requires asking questions nobody else is even thinking to ask because they're not looking at it from all of the vantage points that I am, asking the right questions at the right time to the right people, and then providing a framework that everyone can get behind, that includes everybody's perspectives, that is in the language that they're relating to, that identifies what their problems are so everyone can buy in and, and agree to, yes, not only are we all heading towards the same goal for the product, but this is how we're defining that goal. These are the tools we're using to get there. And this is a process that we're, we're going to take to get there. So, uh, after now that we've established context, I hope, although I, I, <laughs> I don't, I'm not seeing any feedback. I'm only seeing my slides. So I'm at a disadvantage here because I really... I really like to see feedback, but let's define some of the terms. So when I first thought about giving this presentation on how do you define culture, um, I started thinking, well, you know, culture is a big thing. It's addressed in, in management, uh, in innovation, in uh, change agencies, uh, culture, there's a lot of information about culture, but you don't hear of product managers discussing culture all that often. Uh, certainly the ethnographers have, have, have added to the discussion by identifying the importance of culture. But again, we, when we talk about product, we're not talking about a culture for the product, although with with more and more user experience and design thinking, this has become more important. So I was going to discuss culture until last month, uh, Dharma Shah of HubSpot came out with 
uh, their culture code for their organization, 152 slides worth. And it wasn't even new. It was just an uh, in, in iteration. He's done a few blog posts uh, recently in March. And I decided, you know what? It's excellent. Uh, I don't even have to address it. Here's several links. Just go to culturecode.com. HubSpot, what a great place to work. And Dharmesh Shah, these guys know what they're doing in terms of aligning their product vision with the, with the market and, and everything within the organization is aligned. So th- that's all I need to say. And here's some highlights from their culture code. Um, culture is to recruiting as product is to marketing. So one of the things that is often talked about is that hiring product management, hiring developers in, in early stage companies, but in all size companies, hiring the right people is, is key to maintaining and achieving excellence. And so you also always have to be hiring, just like you always have to be marketing. And I really like that their focus at HubSpot is everything is, is based on the customer, not just the customer's happiness, but also the customer achieving what they want to achieve. So understanding how the customer defines what product excellence is for them might be the place to start. Um, another cool thing about HubSpot is they really care about the employees being happy. Great people want direction on where they're going, not directions on how to get there. So definitely uh, check that out. And and I even suggest defining what your ideal culture is and and matching that against is, is your organization where you're at now, does it have potential to match what your ideal is? And if you're looking for a new position, use that as um, one of your metrics for identifying whether a company is a good fit for you. Okay, so how do we define product excellence? Oh, now might be a good time to do a poll, Hector. The one that asks if you have uh, your own uh, document for, for what it means to be a good product manager uh, uh, personally in, in your own profession. Okay, so I am launching this poll right now, and we will give everyone a few, a couple of seconds to actually answer yes or no to this question. Do you have an individual product manager mission statement? Yes or no? So I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. And uh, Cindy, do you want me to show the, the yes. results right now? Please. Or do you want me to wait until Q&A? No, no. Show them now. Okay. So here are the results with re- respect to this particular question. 87% of you say you do not have your own personal product manager mission statement. And only 13% said yes. Okay, the, good to know and understandable. You know, you can actually launch it and it will show on the screen, right? Are you seeing it on the screen? It is, it is. Oh, okay, I, I, shucks, I don't have the view. Okay, thank you. That's okay, so let me hide it and then you can proceed on with your okay. presentation. Thanks for participating. Okay, so in the question... And by the way, I'm asking questions, I'm answering them, but my suggestion is that you live in the question, because if you're working as a product manager, you need to be questioning every day, constantly, not only your own actions, but again, the company's actions, the product process, 
and watching what's going on in the market. So Jeff Bezos, who I say is is really underappreciated, he's the head of Amazon. And I remember when Amazon started, there was one tab. <laughs> and so what we used to, he used to say, um, you know, why is there only one tab? Because from the very beginning, he started with uh, transforming how books are sold, and he had big plans, which he's delivering on the promise. So for, for Jeff, he says, above all else, no matter what else you're doing, align with customers. Win when they win. Win only when they win. And that's how he defines product excellence. When the customer is winning, then your your product is excellent. So, but if you ask different people in your organization what product excellence means. And I suggest you take a poll. It's a great opening uh, conversation, (laughs) an icebreaker, because I also suggest that you walk through your entire organization and talk to everyone because everyone is touching the product. Nobody usually has any idea what product managers do or what the product management function is. So if you go find out what they're doing, you can explain to them what you're doing. And I promise you that's investment in, in the future and that's, that's planting seeds. So this, uh, I love this picture. It's a reference to the, um, uh, the tale of six blind men and they have to collaborate uh, as a team to determine what it is that is in front of them. So they're blind and they only are, have their touch and their senses and their smell to determine. So, of course, the guy who's touching the elephant tusks uh, says, oh, wow, it's hard and pointy, must be a sphere, uh, a spear. And the one who's uh, touching the trunk is saying, oh, it's long and uh, it, it, it folds like a snake. Uh, the woman under one of the big legs uh, says, well, it's like the trunk of a tree. Uh, my, the point is, when you go and talk to different people in the organization, from the financial guys to the sales guys to the customer service to the customer support, their view of the product is very different. You may think that it's an excellent product if you're looking at sales data or if you're looking at feedback uh, coming in online. Depending on where you're looking at the product, you'll get different feedback. But when you actually talk to people within the organization, you'll get a different experience. Um, My favorite people to talk to are tech support and customer service. They're on the front lines. They're actually talking to customers who may not be happy with the product. And that's where, uh, and also tech support and customer service, depending on what kind of product you have, um, not only do they have to be passionate about the product and love the company to stay in on a daily basis, if they're fielding lots of complaints or lots of problems, but they will have insights that nobody else has. And usually they're not um, consulted with when documentation is being prepared or when new product versioning is being prepared. Uh, so, But they're, they're who the customer thinks is the company. So very important to talk to everyone and listen to what they have to say. Because uh, the whole the whole intention of creating the culture is to remove the blinders, so everyone has the same view and recognizes the elephant in the room. So again, uh, how you define product excellence depends on where you're looking. Certainly, if you're in the C-suite, if you're the CEO. Um, if you're investors, if you're on the board, you're going to have uh, a top-level organization view and maybe certainly not a product-centric view if there's many products. And if you're looking at the health of the business, a product is just one, uh, one data point. Uh, so they're not going to be focused on, on the product specifically. Uh, but if you are uh, responsible for product management... Uh, generally, when I speak to product managers, their view is is on what their daily 
implementation and tasks. They're tactical tasks that they have to get done on a daily basis. Their backlog, their requirements, um, the user stories. So they're so involved with the daily managing of the product management process. They're not. They're also not seeing the big view. Um, and so as the individual product manager, you need to be thinking strategically, whether that's built into your job requirement or not. If you want to forward your career, if you want to survive this position, if there's a reorg um, or if your product uh, gets sunsetted or killed or if your company gets bought, you need to uh, – uh, you, you need to be land, land on the ground with, with two feet, with your two feet on the ground. So you always have to be managing your own uh, professional career, even within, within the product perspective. So, so and going back to that, when you start working cross-functionally, even with people who, who you don't interface with, especially with people you don't interface with, you're advancing your career, you're nurturing your network, and you're learning. You're, it, it will just put you in a better position going forward because, uh, gosh, if you're in, if you're in uh, San Francisco, if you're in startups, you never know who you're going to bump in next or who's going to be in the next company or where your next position will be. So what makes a product great depends on who you're asking, where you're looking, what you're touching, and where it is in the product life cycle, and, and also on who's using it. So how do you define product excellence? Well, so I went back into uh, some, some historic data, and Donald Norman uh, is cited, he, he wrote about the invisible computer way back, I think, in the 70s at the beginning of microcomputers. And I remember before there were personal computers. And he, he recognized for technology products, you could, you could map where the product was and, and how you measured the product depended on how mature the product was and how mature the market for the product was. So, um, you know, there was a time when technology products were brand new and there wasn't a great market for them and there wasn't a big experience. So he identified that there's a life cycle that all uh, electronic products go through. And at the beginning, uh, the technology doesn't keep up with what the customers want uh, but it doesn't matter because it's a new product and people will be willing to try it and buy it. And um, those are the early adopters. They're willing to be inconvenienced just for the excitement, the status, and the cool factor. Um, but as they get used to that product being available and other, as other products enter the market, um, the bar is raised for what the expectations are. And that product needs to uh, perform better and be more reliable. And gosh, if you want to talk about uh, cell phones, they used to be cell phones before they were smartphones. And I remember my first one was huge. It was it was big. <laughs> um, and uh, I and you know and so I was with a mobile startup. Gosh, fifteen years ago and. So many of the things we were talking about then, although the data has changed and certainly the technology has changed, but the behavior of uh, and the expectations for what we want in a personal device um, are were the same then um, for what people would want to do with their device. The technology has changed and, and all of the details and certainly the, the experience of using the phone has changed, but... The research that we did 15 years ago is held true. So as Donald Newman was saying, it's a good good read. Um, when the technology exceeds the basic needs of the customers, there's a major change in customer behavior. And then you start recognizing this emotional reaction, this pride of ownership, that people care about the product. It becomes, it becomes theirs. It's no longer a technology product. So then he, he mapped this. Um, so 
uh, over time, the expectations for the product performance is increased. And so the product has to be uh, continually increase to meet the expectations. At the beginning, um, with a minimal viable product, you know the product can suck if it's the only thing in the market. People might still buy it, but you definitely should be learning uh, and improving the product over time um, if you want it to scale and if you want to uh, own the market or, or uh, maintain market share. So then uh, Luke, who is early on uh, in Zoob, in, in Zurb, um, so he he took the technology lifecycle and he was actually looking at it from a user experience point of view, and he mapped um, how to define excellence to each of these points, and so he he broke it out that product excellence measured differently in each of four stages. Uh, stage one, it's just about function. Now, they were originally talking about physical products, but this also rings true for applications and even uh, uh, online software. Uh, so at the beginning, hey, if you're going to enable somebody to do something that they couldn't do before, all they need is that one function and they're going to be delighted. But once they get used to that, they're going to now be asking for new features and new functions, and they're not going to be so delighted if only one thing works. But there is a trade-off of how many features um, they are expecting to have. And as people get used to the features, they expect it to be intuitive, and then their experience, their total experience of using it has to be increasing as they get used to the product and as more products enter into the competitive space. Um, so it's still important that uh, fewer, fewer features will trump more features. So if you only have a couple of features, but they work excellently, that's better than having a lot of features that don't work great. And then the last stage where you want to get to to scale is when uh, it's no longer unique to the product. It's part of um, a larger product mix. You have other entries and so the individual feature is no longer important, but definitely the experience, the price, the, all these other factors and data points become key um, that you have to monitor um, and that you have to, um, you'll have new data points to stay competitive. And it's also at this point when you have to decide, is it time to sunset that product um, how do you uh, version that product? Should you be selling that product? Should you be buying another uh, product? Should you be partnering? Um, it's at the stage four that uh, most startups uh, don't get to. So there is a life cycle that every product, startup, idea, and project passes through to be realized, and it parallels the creative process. It parallels the uh, biological process also. Uh, so I say that if, if we can have a conversation that identifies where the product is in the life cycle, we can get everybody, regardless of their point of view, to have the same conversation. Because even if they have a different perspective of what the product needs, they will agree on where the product is. So how do we know what the life cycle is? Well, here's, here's why I really appreciate the AI PMM. And by the way, um, Hector beat me to the punch <laughs> at the beginning. I really did want to say how much I appreciate the opportunity for moderating these webinars for the past year and why I'm excited to um, have AIPMM support the my efforts um, with the Global Product Management Talk because the AIPMM is the only organization that is committed to forwarding the profession of product management. There is no other trade organization or industry organization for product managers. There's, there's other organizations, but they're not thinking of what does the profession of product management need and what do product management practitioners need in order to forward their career, advance their career, and, and actually have a long career. Um, so what 
we're looking at is the AIPMM Product Management Lifecycle Framework. So it is a framework. This is a very high top level. We're kind of uh, looking at the top of the box, if you will. Um, and it goes into uh, very deep. I just want to stay on it um, as a, at the high level to use as a talking point. There are many frameworks that are available to describe product management, and they're all very complex. And I find that people who aren't product managers care less about those frameworks. They really do not care how we're breaking things up. Um, but they can relate to where the product is and what needs to happen. And so, um, the this framework actually does delve down under each of these phases from conceive, plan, develop, qualify. It identifies who are the different team members that would be involved at that place. What are the deliverables? What are the activities? What is the perspective necessary? But I have found that I can pull this out and it explains what I do as a product manager. I, I am responsible for getting that product from the conceive all the way out to retirement. If I am a strategic product manager, but this is what the NAM product management entails. So to, uh, to advance your career and to be successful, become expert at speaking product at all these phases to understand the different perspectives of different team members and make sure that you deliver results and, per and contribute value at every interaction and every touch point across these phases. Um, and so if you want to find out more information, I'm very excited that I've spoken about it a lot. The AIPMM is constantly updating and providing new trainings and certifications. It's a certified innovation leader that goes into depth about the front end of, of this. It does uh, cover the full framework, but mostly innovation occurs in the front end, the conception and new product development. Um, and so they break it down um, into how to manage the front end. There's more information available. I, I want to mention that the PRODBOC is something that the AIPMM has been uh, forwarding. It's very exciting. So they, the AIPMM uh, identified um, what was missing for product management to be an official profession. And one of the things required for a profession is to have a body of knowledge. Well, every product manager you speak to, and I have uh, done a competitive landscape of the product management uh, ecosystem, so everyone has their own trainings, their own frameworks, their own intellectual property. AIPMM brilliantly got together 60 of the top thought leaders and did a gap analysis of all of the frameworks that exist, including um, product lifecycle management, um, and um, arrived at the uh, lifecycle framework as well as this uh, PRODBOC, which is the documentation is in development. Um, and uh, Greg Gerich. Um, is driving the guide to it, and he's been doing a series with thought leaders on uh, their excitement and their uh, perspective on the value of the PRODBOC. So I have, uh, ah, I'm seeing what we're coming to, oh gosh, a whole hour. Okay, uh, Hector, do we have questions? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And um, also, we also have one more poll question. Do you want me to go ahead with that as well? Um, let's let's get to the. Uh, those are, were questions I was asking the audience. I'm interested. Does the audience have questions for me? And let me just say that the rest of the slides I've included URLs, so they pretty much speak for themselves. I was um, pulling out. Uh, examples of speaking to different uh, people in the organization um, to get their different perspectives. So these are all self-explanatory. Why don't we go into um, 
uh, the Q Q and A if there are any questions because I definitely want someone to win a membership and I want to give a T shirt away. Sure. Okay. So the we do have one que- several questions, and I I actually have picked a few out of the many that have been submitted. So here's uh, the first one. I'm one of many product managers within my company. How do I instill a discipline to become a product driven organization? Excellent. Excellent. And that is the best question to be asking. So that's that's why I think that um, getting well versed in the AIPMM product management uh, framework is a way to have those conversations about what is the product need at each place in the in the phases, but really to pull out and to create the talking points using your own product and using your own business KPIs. So you basically, you become the internal evangelist for what your perspective is and what the product needs, and you take people to lunch and um, and sit down with them and have a casual conversation, whip out the framework and say, hey, here's where we are with the product. Where do you think we are? And here's where I think the gaps are. Here's where I think we're having trouble. Uh, could we work together? You know, what is your suggestion? Um, so just having a, a visual talking point that is a standard, I find is very helpful. So uh, it provides immediate credibility that you've done the research, um, and, it, and it provides an immediate accessibility that people can understand on a high level and maybe simplified level, but it opens a door for you to establish rapport and relationship to talk deeper and to, and to get into a whiteboard with them and hash it out. Great. Thank you very much. Another question is, where can I find a sample job description for each of the roles that you mentioned that are part of product management? Excellent. So here again, um, why I appreciate the AIPMM. Um, on the AIPMM website, there is a whole career section, and there's some excellent tools, and there are some examples of job descriptions. Um, and uh, So just go to AIPMM.com and look under the career section, and you can download them. There's also um, jobs being posted on the AIPMM, and if you follow the AIPMM Twitter, they're always posting jobs, so you can review Um, job descriptions, but I always say write the job description from the relevancy of your product and and build in that it matches to what the business vision and mission is and not just what the ideal requirements are, but build in some actual requirements um, based on what is occurring now, not only where you want someone to take the product. Okay. And then one last question. Uh, We have more that we're not going to get to, but one last question, and then we can get into the actual uh, closing of this and the drawing also, which we'll do at the very end. Uh, And this particular person is in a company that is currently delivering projects as a service provider. And recently the company started looking at how do they actually divide these projects into uh, and define them as products. And Uh, This person is asking, what steps should they follow to build the product management function the right way? Excellent. So if you want to do it from a product point of view, start with, again, each of those projects should have their own business case. What is the mission, the vision, and the ROI, the intended ROI for each of those products? Um, And then... Uh, so you're starting from the end results that you want to achieve and working back to how do those uh, how will those products map out and what will be required for someone to manage those products to achieve those goals and that's how you uh, build in the uh, recognition of 
what it takes, what it will take to manage those products to achieve the ROI that that you're looking for. Would it be one person? Could they be managed as a portfolio? Would it be a whole department? Um, but base it on what are the product needs or what are the product goals, and then define what the position would be. Great. Highly simplified. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Cindy. And at this point, we're ready. To, we want to thank everyone, and we know that we have some questions that we did not get to, but uh, we will allow Cindy to then get directly back to you via email to answer uh, any questions that we did not get to today. And also, here's the information where you can uh, contact Cindy. You can follow her on Twitter or also follow her on all, all these uh, Twitter, Twitter uh, hashtags that are being shown here. And you can also go to her website at Global Product Management Talk as well. And uh, there's plenty of, of uh, sessions, Twitter uh, sessions that are once a week that you can learn uh, what's coming up in that website. Anything else regarding this, Cindy? Um, well, all of the links on each of the slides uh, on the bottom, all those links work. So yes. all the, and, all the uh, URLs are built in. Yes. Also, I want to point out that you will receive a, uh, a link where you can download the entire slide deck so you can have access to all these links, and we will provide that to you via email. Uh, if you are participating in this particular webcast, you will receive that from AIPMM. And also, we want to touch um, on, on some of the upcoming courses. If you're interested in learning more about product management or product marketing or how to deal with uh, as a product manager with an agile environment when you're using agile development methodologies within your workplace. Here are some upcoming courses. The link at the bottom of this particular slide shows information about other locations besides the one that's shown here. We also have courses available in Austin, San Jose, and Seattle in addition to McLean, which is out within the D.C. metro area. And also, if you are out joining us from outside the, the, the U.S., the next slide shows upcoming courses that we have in other parts of the world. We are going to be in Amman, Jordan, as well as in Singapore. And there's some additional dates coming up uh, after June that we'll be announcing at upcoming webcasts. So once again, the links here, you can go and get information about the courses and the content and pricing and all those details. And also wanted to ask you if you have any questions regarding AIPMM membership or certification courses near you, or even how to prepare for certification ex exam, you can uh, contact me directly at this email address and let me know how I may be able to help you and provide you some guidance regarding uh, what you should be looking at next. So with that, we are uh, also would like to help to uh, invite you to join us. We have these weekly web webcast every Friday at 12 noon Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific, and also uh, uh, we have additional ones that are coming up in the next in, in the next Friday. There's a link where you can actually register for this particular event, and also you can go to our webinar site. So you can see additional upcoming webcasts. Um, by the way, and the date for the next uh, next Friday with Jose uh, Briones, uh, that should be April 19th. A week from today. That yeah, is correct. it's showing April 12th. And the next Global Product Management Talk is this coming Monday, April 15th. And the topic is here. And also, if you follow this link, you'll see the uh, actual description of, of the topic and the discussion that will occur. Oh. And the bottom links contain information as to where you can go for more information regarding AIPMM. I saw that some of you um, were asking about membership. You can actually get information about becoming an AIPMM member at the membership link that is shown at the bottom of this particular slide. And we welcome any inquiries regarding membership and benefits. And we have a drawing to do. Yes. So at this point, we have a drawing. And the first prize will be the Product Camp Silicon Valley t-shirt. And I will draw that at random from the list of people who are still um, with us uh, right now. And <laughs> the 
winner is Mary Mary Droessy. Oh gosh, she is lucky. Mary, you 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 win. That's great. I'll, I I can hand it to you in person, Mary, at the next meetup. Great. And now we have the second giveaway, which we'll also be selecting at random based on uh, questions and participation. And the second the the second giveaway is actually a twelve month premium membership to AIPMM. And the winner of this is. Oleg Naliviako. Uh, please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Oleg Naliviako uh, is the last name. So, Oleg, congratulations. Awesome. And you will, we will be directly via email to actually uh, let you know how to go about signing up for the free premium membership from AIPMM. So, with that, I'd like to thank Cindy for. Uh, for her great discussion, and also would like to invite you to see, to see, hopefully see you next week, where we will have another webcast, and we will see you soon. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Hector. Thank you, AIPMM, and thank you, participants. Have a great week.